sessions for you. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. I want to introduce uh, Connie Palmer, who is uh, CEO of uh, My Home, Your Home, and Lisey's Place is one of the programs uh, that is under the My Home, Your Home umbrella of services. And I, I think some of you had a chance to, to visit, and, um, and Connie is going to give you uh, all the information you'll ever want to know, and, and hopefully maybe get you coming back for more about what Lisey's Place is about and what <coughs> your home is all about and um, and how we might connect with uh, St. Matthew. So, Connie. Thank you, Lee. Am I on? I'll turn you on. on. Everybody can hear me, right? I don't need a mic, do I? You do. I do. Okay. <laughs> Try that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nope. A little more. Right, there you go. You can hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a commercial. Yeah. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. I'm Connie Palmer with My Home, Your Home. You can hear? Yeah. Okay. With My Home, Your Home. The organization started in 1992, and like we said, Lisey's Place is one of our programs. We have several different programs at My Home, Your Home. One being a treatment foster care. Um, women who, um, and then we also have, I'm sorry, we also have a wraparound service program, both wrap and reach. And what that program does is it wraps services around all the family instead of just the child who's in care. And our treatment foster care program is working with kids with more severe behavior problems or kids who are medically needed. We also have a program called RCU, is working with adults who are recovering from drug and alcohol. And then our other program, which is Lisey's Place, and like I shared before, Mrs. Walker's goal for Lisey's Place was so many young women were aging out of the foster care system at that time, and she was wondering what will happen to those young girls. So I want you to watch a brief video, and after the video, uh, I'll entertain any questions, okay? does not exactly feel well when it's raining. You don't know where you're going to get your next meal. You don't know where you're going to get help when you need to go to the doctor. You don't know where you're going to get your next picture. Yeah, I feel like things are definitely out of control. You know, when you're a young, rebellious teen, you think that you want all that freedom and you want to do what you want to do. But as you get older and you see the real world, you see it is scary and it's not as easy as you think. I was so homeless. I, couldn't, I didn't know how to find a job. I really didn't have a place to go. But I was, you know, bouncing between friends and hotels, and I didn't stay in cars before. Like, it's, it's pretty bad. And I needed a positive place that could help me, um, that could better me. And Lizzie's place was the place for me. 
the staff here are individually I, I, I seven I'm people for the seven days that you need. I am here. And you know it's there and you're all in support from someone. I like to look at staff as another support oh, system for the women. When they're going through or they're feeling down, they know that there is someone here that cares about them. So staff is pretty good with assisting the women and letting them know how to do things appropriately. And sometimes we're just here to be a listening ear to those women because sometimes they just want somebody to hear them and know what it is that they're going through. But a lot of yes. times I laugh, yep. the kids don't cry because I've been through a lot. I'm not really a people person and I was, I've never been a people person. So when I came here, I felt kind of, you know, bottled in. I didn't know who to talk to. For me, being a shy person, you know, I don't really like hang around a lot of people. So I actually met some people here that I actually got along with. But now I feel like I can talk to anyone here now. We actually run two different programs. One is our transitional housing program, and one is our independent living program. For the transitional housing program, the young women come in at the age of 18 to 29. They can stay here for up to two years. We actually have 14 bedrooms for those individuals. We also have the independent living program. Uh, those young women come in at the age of 17 and a half, and they are coming for wraparound, so we do have to have a wraparound care coordinator in order to be able to get into the program. They're there for me to get on my feet, to get a job. I recently got a job. Um, they're just supportive in every way. But they could be like talking to me, just being there for me as much as they can. of volunteers who come in and they help keep the boutique up and help the girls get outfits that make them feel special. They're just in awe. Every time they come in, they're so excited to look through the things. The boutique is actually a store and the boutique came to be by um, the life skills specialist Eileen Beard. It was her dream to do something like this. So she assembled 30 volunteers and we all came together and took this storeroom and turned it into uh, actually a work of art. They have a, um, something called You Go Girl Point and you could um, do a lot of things around the house to collect points to go up to the boutique. That, but you can do extra chores for points to do the boutique and stuff. So I have a, my eye on a purse down there, so I'm going to be doing some extra. <laughs> We get less than half of our funding from uh, the state, from HUD, and then we do get a portion from the wraparound program, but it is not enough to cover uh, the needs for the women here in the program. So we do, we reach out to the community, and we reach out to others to assist us and to help us with the funding and also to help us with volunteer work to give the women what it is that they need. Oh my God, I remember when I got the key, I cried. I cried, I even had a house key, a key to my own space in like so long. Some of the girls come in here with absolutely nothing. So it helps them put clothes on their back, it helps put food in their stomach, uh, plates over their head, and just like certain things that are comforting, like that you don't think that you need, like toothbrush, or food conditioner. So they give you a lot of freedom here to not only grow as an individual, but also they respect your space. Um, the other day, I learned how to make a nice casserole. Well, the kitchen's open for a certain amount of time. I meet up like three or four hours in like the early morning for like the first shift people. Then there's lunch and then there's evening. There's a dine out where you get all your food. You know, you get your own little cubby space for your own individual food. So you can go there and like nuke up anything with the microwave or take sandwich out from the fridge.
the laundry, there's two washers, two dryers, and you got to sign up for it, otherwise it would not function. Someone would have stuff in there when they're not supposed to be there. So there's uh, sign up for everything, like for the computer, you get up to two hours. Sometimes I draw traditionally, and sometimes I draw digitally, so I don't want to use computers to do like a one of my projects or whatever, art projects, I can do that. <laughs> There's a little TV room downstairs where we get to watch TV, if, you know, if someone's visiting, in the, you know, it's like, I call it the living room, but it's the visitor's lounge. Um, if someone's visiting there and you want to watch TV, you can always go downstairs. Like, there's different levels. Like, even up here, you can watch a movie over there at that TV, or you can come work out. Like, every room has a different purpose. I like to think of us as a support system for the women. Uh, for those women that's coming in off the street, sometimes they don't have that self-esteem or the, the different knowledge that they need to be successful on their own, I believe that we are the ones that can offer them that support. The staff is really, they're really, you can tell they're genuine, you know, it's not just a job for them, they actually enjoy and they actually care about our growth, not only as an individual, but as women and leaving whatever past starts that we have behind us in order to become productive people. So I've learned a lot here. Um, I came here, I had an angle problem, and I've like really gotten better with it. And, you know, the staff has helped me overcome anger and the things that I've gone through in my life. And, you know, I'm, I'm really a sweetheart now. <laughs> 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 When we, you know, we, like last night we had girl, girl talking, you know, so yeah, it is kind of, it's more with the girls, it's more like a friendship, like a girl, like a club, and with the staff, it's more like a like family environment. Because like, you know, you have expectations, you have goals, you have rules, you have everything else, but at the same time, you still have each other to run to, which makes it like, like, how can I describe it, like, oh, uh, I just, I really appreciate this right that's all I can say because like I don't even know I probably do know where I'd be but not where I want to be. We would just like to take this opportunity to thank all the volunteers, all the funders and supporters of this place. If you have helped us over the years it is greatly appreciated. It's you that has helped us to help the women that we serve. So again thank you once again for all of your support. I also had Mamie come up here because Mamie also works with Lisey's Place and she can kind of give you an idea of what a typical day looks like at Lisey's Place, how women come into Lisey's Place. And um, we have a total of 17 women we can house. And Carolyn mentioned in the video is two separate programs, one being independent living, which are wraparound girls. And a lot of times when girls get to a certain age, 17 and a half, they don't fit well in a residential facility or in a foster home setting. So we take in those girls for the independent piece. And our goal is, especially for our women who are 18 to 29, is to be mentors and big sisters for the 17 and a half year olds. Sometimes it gets a little rough because the 17 and a half year olds get away with a little bit more than of course our 18 to 29. So I wanted Mamie to talk a little bit about that and I'm gonna give you just the mic, maybe have a help. I have a bigger voice though. <laughs> <laughs> you guys hear me? She has a, a softer voice than I do. Okay, I hope I can blow this thing up. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. What a blessing and an honor to be here. We really appreciate it. Um, like Connie said, I actually work at Lisey's Place. I actually started as a volunteer after I lost my job, didn't know where I fit in, and God led me there, and it's been a tremendous blessing for me to be able to serve these young women. Um, we call them, it's like, fa it's a family environment. It's not the typical setting for what is traditionally known as like a shelter, because Lisey's Place is actually a program. So a shelter is a place where young women and men go to just sleep and find, you know, have a safe place to live. Lisey's Place is a program, so there's things that they have to do there in order to stay at Lisey's Place. One thing they have to do is each girl is required to do 30 hours of goal-related activity every single week. So they have to fill out a log indicating what they did to try and accomplish their goal. For some, their goal is to get into college. For some, their goal is to get their GED. For others, it may be finding employment. We also have young women that because they became homeless, they lost custody of their children. So they're working to get a job and working through the court system to gain custody of their children again. All of these things that these young women are in need of, we have resources. So some we have inside 
in in house. Most are we work with other agencies. We have relationships with other agencies in the city, and we do a lot of legwork on our own to find places to give them the help that they need. Every young woman is required to do a chore. So every week I make a weekly chore list, and that you have to do it one chore, the same chore for for seven days. So by the time they leave, that's helping them to be self-sufficient. They can clean the house from, from top to bottom, inside and out. I joke about that sometimes because I've been at the house and I see the girls washing the walls down and I've seen girls out in the field like picking up grass or not you grass, pet, paper and what have you. And I was like, you guys got our girls out here doing that. Then I find myself at home washing down the wall, <laughs> picking up the paper and I'm saying, yes, they're teaching them the skills that they're gonna need once they move out and once they have their own and taking ownership of those things. Sorry. Absolutely, no, no problem at all. Well, one of the things that we really like to instill in them is pride and ownership. So for as long as you're at Lisey's place, <clears throat> this is where you live. This is your space, this is your home. And it really is a home environment. You know, they call us mom and, you know, and, and we love on them when they need it. And, you know, we're listening ear. We have several staff members that work there and it's a 24 hour facility. So there's some, there's staff there 24 hours around the clock. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, we have one young woman who's been there probably about seven or eight months. It took her about three months after she, two months after she um, had lived with us. She came to me one night and she said, I haven't told anyone this because I'm very embarrassed, but I'm afraid of the dark because of something that happened to me as a child. So I really don't like it when staff comes and says, you need to turn your lights off. But we didn't know that. So there is a period of time where they have to feel comfortable with who we are because a lot of these women have been violated in lots of different ways. So that we have to build a trust and a relationship with them. So, and that's where the community comes in. You get an opportunity to build a relationship. Your giving helps build a relationship. It helps us to find resources for the women. It helps us to provide them with the love, the care, and the goods that they need to help them feel good. On the video, it showed the boutique there. The boutique, it's a merit system. They earn points doing over and above what they're required to do to be at Lisey's Place. Then they can come in and have a shopping experience, which is something they wouldn't ordinarily get to have. You know, anytime we have extra work in the house, the ladies come in and, you know, they help us do extra things in the house. At Thanksgiving, we cook together and we have a Thanksgiving meal, you know, on some of the other holidays. And we're so blessed that people in the community donate turkeys and food and things like that. And sometimes people want to come in and cook a meal with the girls. All of those things help them to have a sense of family. So we're trying to build a bridge that was broken and also to let them know that Milwaukee is a city that cares. And your church is a place they care. So we look forward to the partnership that we're going to have with you. And we are so grateful to God that you've agreed to help us. Thank you. And is there any questions? Thank you. Do you have any religious affiliation? With Lisey's place? Yes. We are housed in St. Catherine's Convent. Okay. So we get that building rent free. Okay. And it's kind of nice because we have that relationship also with St. Catherine's Parish. Do the girls have any kind of religious component to the programming? Are you unable to do that because of certain... We just don't do it, but a lot of our young ladies who come to Lisey's Place do go to church mm -hmm. and have different places that they do fellowship at. Um, you just you do get that building free, but it costs. It's what I always say what's free is not free <laughs> because you know we had to get new windows because that building was pretty old, mm -hmm. and we gave us a grant that we were able to um, get new windows because the windows were dry rotted. So it really helped because the girls were freezing in their rooms. Now, unfortunately, it's so warm that they're opening the windows now, <laughs> so they can the room can be comfortable to live in. So the relationship with St. Catherine's Church has been great. At, from the beginning, and we're continuing to upgrade. If you notice, some of the rooms were decorated. When we first, well, when Mrs. Walker first started it, she did it as a model room. She had a, a model um, a designer come in and do one room, and then we opened it to the community. And what happened is you had mothers and daughters, you had sorority groups, you had teachers at uh, universities coming in and decorating the, the room. Since then, uh, Mount Mary School of Design has chosen our organization, and they have now decorated rooms. And which is interesting because it helps the girls to now have a skill or a career that they never thought about. So they have a lot of input on their room if it's being decorated. We actually have a young woman in the house that um, when she, from the moment she came, just looking around at the house and when she heard me doing a tour and showing uh, our visitors room, which I hope some of you guys will come in tour as well, that Mount Mary had did the design there and it's her desire to go to school for interior design. 
She didn't tell anyone that at first, but just listening and observing and, you know, a, a, a midnight conversation that came out in the conversation. So now we're working to try and help her to get accepted in the college so she can uh, live out her passion and her dream. Uh, and funny story that uh, every time, you know, when we have on our third floor, it's the room that was really colorful. There were some things that were, we were moving some things around and I went downstairs because I got busy when I came back. She had position, repositioned everything. <laughs> yeah. So she really has a, a knack for it, you know, and it's, uh, and we want them to succeed in whatever their passion is. So it's really a nice environment for me to work in to be able to nurture them along to not just be successful in the things that you have to do, but also in doing something that you want to do. I saw some more hands. Are we women find? How do they find Lisey's place? You have to come in that program and you have to show a sign of homelessness. So if you slept in a car, that is not a sign. You would have to come from a shelter or a women's facility and they would have to write a paper, a piece of paper or a report saying that you were homeless, you stayed overnight one night in their facility. That's because of HUD and when we get the dollars from HUD, they show that you have to show some type of sign of being homeless. We currently have about 15, I think from the last time I heard, women on our waiting list. For the whole year of 2013, I had between 150 girls who were on our waiting list. What happens is when you go, when that list comes up, we we have the rooms ready in 24 hours. If someone moves out in 24 hours, the room is ready. We go through that list. Sometime number has changed, person has moved, uh, no longer can reach that individual. So we go through that list to now bring somebody else into a room. The girls can stay, and I know this is a question that's probably going to come up, the, the young women, the 18 to 29 year old women, they can stay up to two years. They may not need two years, it may depend on what their goal is. Uh, we had a young woman that came last year and she became homeless, lost custody of her children, she was working, so she ended up working a couple of jobs, not having to pay rent, living at Lisey's place, so she was able to save her money and get, an up, and get a place, went back to the courts, and she got custody of her kids in less than six months. So she had a goal to, uh, to be in and out of Lisey's place in six months. So we helped her with every resource that we could, and she was very successful in doing so. The other women, that can, they can stay up to two years. Within that two years' time, we helped them along the way. Okay, when you first came in, this was your goal. So they regularly meet with, we have an in-house case manager, with where are you on your goals and what can I do to try and help you along the way because it looks like you really haven't done anything to reach that goal. So if your goal is to go to college, you know, have you applied? Have you met with a guidance counselor there? Have you talked to someone about um, financial aid and those things? So we just kind of give them a little nudge along the way. But it is a two-year program, so that's a lot of time. That's a good amount of time to get on your feet. I thought I saw another question, though. I'm sorry. Um, your goal T, is that open just for your residents, or is it open to the public? <coughs> it's really open to the residents, and the goal of the boutique is sometimes, like I think one of the ladies said in the video, they come with nothing. So we want to make sure we, fit, we, um, we dress the whole body. So it's not just clothes, it's undergarments, it's jewelry, it's handbags, it's shoes. And then if they have a job interview, we let them go and shop more and get items. However, they would have to earn points and they call it the you girl, you go girl points. And that's doing something extra in the community. So yes, to answer your question, the boutique is strictly for the ladies at Lacey's Place. However, we do have a clothing bank that has everyday clothes and they can shop there any time that they want. So the clothing that we get that comes in, you know, the everyday clothes, the jeans, the sweaters, the jackets, things like that, even everyday bags, they can shop downstairs anytime they want. I'm just, can you tell them about the, the savings account in that program that you have? What we, we require is ladies don't have to pay rent, but they have to pay 10% toward program fees. That's HUD's regulation. So they don't have to pay rent. So if you get $100 a month, you pay $10 to live at Lisey's place. And that's toward program fees. And then we ask that they say $60. Mm -hmm. We ask that they say, we've had some women who left the program that has saved quite a bit of money. We've had some women who met a man, saved money. I think she gave him the money to buy a car. He left, lost, gone. Mm -hmm. By the time she left, I think she had $100. Mm -hmm. But we encourage that they save money. And I said it in the presentation and in service is that human trafficking, Milwaukee is a hub. We don't hear that as much, but it's a hub. And it's not that you just tell girls or young women, you don't want to live that lifestyle, but you empower them. And when you feel good about who you are, you don't get caught up in that lifestyle. So our goal is to always 
empower these women, mm -hmm. make them feel good about who they are. Because I mean, when I was in college, I got approached by different people to say, I can you know, get you here and get you there, and oh, you'd be great in pictures. I said, yeah, right. But I had parents who told me, I was, you know, I was great. I had parents who encouraged me. A lot of times the girls didn't have that. So when you don't have that, and you're not constantly being, don't, being told that, then your self-esteem is shot. So our goal is to empower these women, make them feel good about who they are. Any other questions? I was downstairs, so this was asked earlier, I think, uh, if maybe, what criterion are used to decide this young lady is ready to, to transition out of Lizzie's place to the more natural world, so to speak? Well, Lizzie's place, it's volunteer. It's, you know, they can leave at any time that they <coughs> choose to leave to. So if they feel that they're ready, they can move on. We've had women that have lived there for two weeks and left. You know, they came, they, they you know, and also, it's not a good fit for everyone because it is a program and it's not a shelter. So if you're a person that can't abide by the rules, like the chore has to be done by 930 every night, they have to do their own, and we didn't talk about this, they have to do their own menu planning, they have to do their own grocery shopping, they have to wash their own clothes, it's independent living. We're helping to enhance that skill. So if you don't know that skill, we'll teach you that skill, but you're responsible for taking care of yourself so that you'll be self-sufficient. Um, but at any time, if they decide they want to move, they just let us know they want to move out, and they move, and we flip the room, redecorate it, and we call someone on the list, and another person is more than welcome to come as long as they meet the criteria. Yeah, a lot of times the girls just feel like, I got it. I think mm -hmm. I got everything I need, and I'm ready to go. But the understanding we try to make sure they get is that you can't come back for six months. Mm -hmm. So we've had girls come back and say to the other ladies there, stay here. Get what you need before you walk away. I remember one time we had one young lady who um, who wanted, she met a guy, she, I think she had two kids and she had her kids taken away from her. She met this guy, she ran his background, she had her, her um, kid's attorney run the background on this person. She was just determined and staff said, we've talked to her, we've said this. And I even sat down, I said, come on, are you serious? Is this really what you want to do? I mean, you can see the guy, but don't move out. You know, and she was determined. She was determined. And the girls even said to her, when he pulled up outside, he didn't come in to help her move her stuff. The ladies in the house helped her move her stuff to the car. And they said, are you serious? You really want to go? And he's not even helping you? Imagine what it's going to look like when you're with him. And she did. I don't know what happened to this young lady, but she did it. But we tried to encourage them to stay. But a lot of times, they think they got it. They think they're ready. And they realize that sometimes their family members are not there for them. The thing about women that are abused, the reason they fall prey to people like this and prey to human trafficking is because the common denominator with all of them is a love deficit. Um, they, they are broken women. They, they've been abused sexually, mentally, verbally, you name it, a little bit of everything. And when you've experienced that as an individual, if, if Things that, lots of things look like love that really aren't. So they gravitate toward things that look like love and that creates a problem for them. We try and shield them from this, but because they're adults, all we can do is suggest and recommend and in giving any type of good counsel to another human being, but especially younger people, uh, the ideal is that you talk to them in such a way that they make the decision and they make the choice and you make you know a subtle type of suggestion and then because that's part of growing up, is that they have to learn how to make good choices and good decisions for themselves. So it's a bit challenging for us sometimes, considering what some of the women have been through, and that they're so hungry for love, that they're desperate and they feel like, no, he's the one, or this is the right place for me to go. So it's difficult for us, because like Connie said, if they leave, so if, if they've been there, back to your question earlier about how long they can stay, um, if they've, they've, been, they've been there less than two years and they leave, they can come back you know, and finish out their two years with us, but they have to wait for six months. A lot can happen in six months, which is why what Connie mentioned earlier, please make sure that this is the right decision for you, that this is the best decision, that you're going to be safe, and you're going to continue to uh, strive to accomplish your goal. I'm not the good person to stay there, because normally when they do something and they, they may have to leave the organization, or leave the house, they could sit up to the admin building. I'm not the person, because I always <laughs> and I always send them back and say to staff, we have to give them another chance. So I'm, I'm the easy person, so I don't want to see a woman homeless, even if she created a fight, even if she's, you know, drugs is one thing, but even if some things have happened, I always say, 
okay, can we give her another break? And staff always hate for me to have Well, here's one thing about that. Um, it's been a learning process for me. I've been with an organization for a little bit over two years now and uh, has spent many hours with this woman right here who has really mentored me and taught me a lot of things. Initially to me, um, okay, so we have uh, a disciplinary, um, um, what's the word for process of discipline. So uh, there's a verbal, then there's a written, and there's you know probation, and then there's meet with the program manager. And after you've gone through this, and they get many, many, many chances. We write them up. They, if it's a chore, they do double chores, then triple chores, and they meet with the big boss, and she <coughs> kind of slaps them on the hand, and they keep going. What I have learned in the process, especially in regards to chores, is something that just really was an eye opener for me, and it really broke my heart to find out why a lot of these women don't do chores. There was a young woman who's gone now. She, she just moved out into her own place recently, real proud of her. She worked three jobs to get there. But when she came to us, so I did her intake, and I was, you know, after I did her intake and reading back through her paperwork, she never cleaned her room, and it was a huge problem. You know, the smell was bad in her room, and no matter what we did, no matter how many times she was written up, she couldn't keep her room clean. That woman came to us prior to being in a cathedral center, I think one of the homeless shelters, just 24 hours in order for her to qualify to be in Lisey's place, she was living in a condemned house. So there was no water, there was no heat, you know, the place was filthy, but it was a place where she could sleep. So for a person like that, just give me a space where I can lay my head and I'm good. The rest of that doesn't matter to me. You know, and another thing about, you know, women being abused, um, um, I was having, again, trouble understanding, you know, what's the big deal with the room? Why can't you keep your room clean? But we all struggle that, with that with our teenagers, right? <laughs> but it's to the extreme with some of these women where clothes are stacked up and you can't get through. And for women that have been abused, it can sometimes be a defense mechanism. If I keep my room dirty, and a case study that um, uh, the uh, life skills specialist was sharing with me, a case study about a woman that kept small containers of urine place different places in a room so the room smelled so bad the perpetrator wouldn't want to come in. Hmm. So they things that they do, there's really, it's not our logic, but it's their logic, the way they do things like that because they're trying, the hope is that dad's not going to come in here trying to abuse me tonight. Or if, you know, I'm, and I'm staying with a cousin and my parents are making me go, but maybe he'll stay away from me if I don't take a shower. So it's been a huge education uh, for me to try and figure out how they think, but everything they do and they don't do, there's a reason for it. And mostly, it's a defense mechanism. And a survival skill. That's a better term to use. It's a survival skill. Because if you're living out on the street, you have to do everything you can, particularly as a woman, to protect yourself. Any other questions? That's how one <coughs> one. Um, just, you know that some of these young girls you know, might be addicted to drugs or is I mean, I know you can provide services, they have to be stable when they come to Lisey's place because we have had referrals from Meta House, which is a drug and alcohol rehab facility. They have to be 30 days stable. Um, at Meta House, which when they come to us, women that are from that particular place, um, they do get re drug tested regularly. It's part of their rehabilitation. Now, if we have someone that comes with um, just a casual use pass where they haven't been to a facility, um, they may or may not be honest with us that that's what's going on and we have had some women that we had to remove because they weren't honest and we found out that they were using on the premises and we removed them for two reasons. For one, you're endangering yourself and also other women that are in the program, particularly because we have 17 year olds that are, you know, um, they need a little bit more guidance and, you know, if they're having a bad day that may be, e they're easily persuaded to do something like that. But we have to take their word for it that they are who they say they are. Because in doing the intake, some information they give you, some information they don't. But after, because I actually work there with them, I see their story unfold. You know, so and just from patterns, from watching over the couple of years that I've been there now, you can kind of tell. You know, okay, you because a lot of them come in very defensive. You know, I don't trust you, I don't know you, don't touch me. But that again is a survival skill and a defense mechanism. So and after a while, it's amazing that they realize that this is a safe place. And these people really do care. So it's a privilege and an honor for me to be able to serve people that are in need. Because to me, what we're doing is we're serving God by serving them. For the 
independent living, you said they have to be referred through wraparound? For the, uh, yes, independent living. Is that court ordered wraparound or can it be it's not it's court ordered? Did, did you talk about what you give the young women when they leave? Oh, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm the donations coordinator, and I, I pretty much take care of all the donations. Um, and just yesterday, uh, one of our greatest success stories moved out yesterday. She's been with the program for two years, and when she came in, because of some, some traumatic things that happened in her life, um, her social skills were not great. As a matter of fact, she was actually afraid to be in a room with a lot of people and talk to people. and. And you know, things happen to people and sometimes they never give you all the details, but she was very frightened. So yesterday marked, not quite two years, she had a, a few more weeks before two years, but she found her own place. She's been saving her money. She's been working for a very long time, saving her money. So she had plenty of money, has a wonderful place on the east side of Milwaukee in a very safe neighborhood. So one of the things that we like to do in the wish list that I gave you, it serves a couple purposes. It helps us with the needs that we have to maintain the house, but also, which is why we like to get as many new items as possible, when they leave, we give them, I call it a welcome home basket. So the welcome home basket has something for every room. So in the kitchen, it'll have dishes and, and silverware and kitchen tiles and rugs and Tupperware bowls and things like that. And then, you know, in the living room, maybe some pictures for the wall and um, and anything for the bathroom, things of that nature. We also like to give them, you know, we give them toiletries and we also like to give them cleaning supplies. These are all things that are very expensive when you first move into an apartment. And the young lady uh, yesterday, because what we asked them to do is make a list of what you need. Because sometimes, some of the women, when they know they're going to move out and they have a plan, they start purchasing things with their check. And what I advise them, buy one thing. You know, if you know you've got a two-year plan, buy one thing every time you get paid. By the time you move out, you have everything that you want. She had five things on her list. That was it. Five things. When she left, she had probably this corner <laughs> up this high to things that we prepared for her to take with her to get started without having to spend a lot of money and also to let her know, you made it and we're proud of you. So we want to send you off in style. That's wonderful. And we're going to um, add Lisey's place to our giving tree this year. Well, we may have two trees. <laughs> um, so some of those items that are on the list, I don't know if everybody got it, but um, we'll have tapes um, for things that can be um, given to Lisey's place. The other thing that we're doing is Rosie has coordinated um, a women's clothing um, collection. And are we doing it in the in spring? spring? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So, so, we'll, yeah, so save your clothes. <laughs> Connie, you told me when we were there that you put that some larger size clothing and yeah, we always need larger sizes and larger shoe sizes, right? Mm -hmm. We always struggle with that as well. And and nice professional. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to talk about the professional clothes. We do need some professional clothes, but a lot of these women have never had jobs ever. So a lot of the jobs that the women have are blue collar jobs, <coughs> cashiering positions, and things like that. But we do need some professional clothing but not an abundance. We need more of the very nice, because this is what I tell them when they're getting ready for an interview. If you it doesn't matter where you're working, look your best wherever you're going. So a lot of the girls recently interviewed for Walmart, one of the ladies interviewed for factory work, and I said, even if it's a factory job, because she had no idea what to wear, a black shirt, black pants, or black jeans, even as long as they're in really good shape, nice shoes, little lip gloss, comb your hair, and wear your smile, and take your confidence with you. What are your major sources of financial funding? We get, um, like Carolyn said in the video, less than half from HUD, and the rest we do is through fundraising and um, personal giving. That's where we get the majority of our money. We have a lot of uh, foundations and corporations that support the organization, but we always need more. And I know that this is United Way campaign time, so in your organizations, you can write us in. Certain corporations don't, like if you're with the state or the county or with the university system, they won't allow you to write the organization in, but other organizations will allow you to do that. So we always need that as well. Thank you. I have some nice plaques to documentary if I need to, like, it's called Very Young Women. It's about human trafficking and, yeah, yeah, the average age is like 13. 
So I'm imagining that some of these girls have been in the life um, before they come to you. Do you have a security system set up to protect them from? Well, well basically, house? I'm sorry. sorry. Basically, on your brochures, if you notice that the address is not there. And uh, if I lived in the house and you were to come see me and you don't know my last name or you don't know what room I'm in, the staff does not give out that information. Um, when we set up tours like this, we do have the information to share. But when, for example, when we celebrated our 10th year anniversary of Lisey's Place, we wanted to just tell the world in the city of Milwaukee, we wanted to go on the news and the radio and tell everyone. But then we realized we're not protecting these women. So we have to just tell people who are within our circle because that's a prime part, a prime target for a pimp. Because in that way he gets into the building, he gets the way to walk around the girls' rooms and things, see those things. And uh, even though the community knows we're there, we're still protected and the girls are still protected. So you cannot call or ring the doorbell if you don't have my first, last name, and my room number. Even if a job called, they have to know that information as well. Which they very well should. So, and we've heard pretty much everything as far as people trying to get information, get in. The building is secure. You do have to. Uh, we have a viewer, so you ring the doorbell. You tell us who you are, and um, if you're from St. Matthews, we'll let you in. But <laughs> 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 and also the um, uh, the girls have their own room, but visitors cannot be in the room with the girls, um, and they can't have visitors from the opposite sex in their room or girlfriends. You know, be that the case. Or case might be. We have an area downstairs for them to visit so it's a program and they have to respect all the women in the house so that's why the visits are limited because there may be someone that's not not comfortable with a lot of people so we do everything that we can to make it comfortable for everyone that lives there. I think you had a question. I'm sorry. I was just gonna make an observation. This must be a real roller coaster for the two of you. <laughs> Up and down and I mean, it, because of all the things that, that are a part of all the lives of everybody that you deal with, how do you handle that? It's a labor of love. It, yeah. And I'm not housed at Lisey's place, but I do get over there all the time. But I just believe, like Mamie always says, um, for some who don't know, my home, your home was started by my mother. And my mother um, is no longer here now. She died in oh, 2008. But her goal was to, and she always taught us, is to love and always give. And I'm a Christian as well, so I know that this is my mission. And I believe God has placed me in that position for that reason. So he gets me through. He carries me through a lot of it. I don't, I'm not in it like the staff because I think that's why I give in all the time. Because I'd be thinking, there's no way. But they see it more. So I do, my hats is always off to the staff that works directly with the residents because I see them on a regular basis and I don't know all the things that they go through. And when I hear stories, and that's why I'm so into the human trafficking because I'm a woman and I can't imagine that happening to anyone. And when I see what the young girls go through, I try to be there for them because that's our goal is to build them, make them feel good about who they are. Well, I, I never really saw myself doing this kind of work ever. I worked in corporate America. I lost my job totally unexpected. And God brought me here, and I don't ever see myself doing anything else because someone said to me in my church once, I was talking about Lisey's Place, because I talk about Lisey's Place every place that I go, because it's in my heart. We were on assignment. The woman said to me, and I said, what are you talking about? She said, you're on assignment. This is your assignment from God. It may be always, it may be just now, but that's why you're good at what you do and getting people involved and because sharing the passion that you have. I don't call it passion, I just call it love because I want everybody to feel like I do about these women because I am my brother's keeper. It's who God called us to be. We are supposed to help each other, so it's a privilege to me. Um, do they have, uh, do you have hours for the Girls, they, they have a curfew. curfew. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. Our younger girls who are 17 and a half is across the board at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Not unless you get um, their care coordinator or someone proves them to stay overnight. HUD says if you're homeless, you don't have anywhere to sleep at night. So girls have to stay at Lisey's place, depending if they work their shift, it depends on their work schedule. But it's normally, what is it, midnight? Monday it's uh, Monday, Sunday through Thursday, 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday is 1 p.m. And then on holidays, we do extend, you know, we let them have the 1 p.m. Cur curfew on holidays because a lot of them do have families in the city. Um, so we do allow them to stay out on that particular day. So we don't, you know, if you stay overnight, 
and don't come home until the next day. You do get written up. And if it happens several times, then you can eventually be evicted. Three times, and they, they, they be evicted. But understand, we had one lady whose children were taken away from her, and they were in Chicago. And a lot of times, she would go and visit. But we just say, make a phone call. If you know you're running late and you're not going to make it back, make that phone call so staff knows that that's happening. But HUD says, if you can stay all night somewhere, then you're not homeless. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. I hope we gave you as much information as possible and shared with you what we do and would love to have that partnership with your church. Thank you. Thank you.